there was a US Special Forces member who came in probably at like 1 a.m. Several people came into the emergency department and they called me in because he had smacked his own face with a grenade launcher. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill me, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down the Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. Point, right? you're, you're going to a I could never often. not go back. They were my friends and they felt the top like the like She did and say, fight. you've changed. The soldier put everything on the line to help one of our boys. Dr. Ajitha Sugnanam is a dentist and squadron leader in the Royal Australian Air Force. I spoke with Ajitha over Skype about her passion to help people and how she's achieving that through her military career. Thanks for coming on the podcast. No problem. Anytime. Where did you grow up, Ajitha? In a lot of places, actually. So I was born in Saudi Arabia and my parents are Indian originally. We moved to Australia, I did high school in Canada, and then I came back, did university in Australia and joined the Defence Force. How old were you when you moved to Australia the first time? Three. So tell me a bit more about your childhood growing up. You're moving around a lot, so what are some of your key interests or hobbies? So I guess I moved around because my father's a chemical engineer. I was a little bit of a bookworm, to be honest. That's what my parents drilled into me. I didn't know how to swim until like I was in my teenagers, even though I grew up in Australia. So um, I'm not entirely sure what my hobbies were, just like my neighbourhood good friends, I think. Going up the family tree, do you have any military history there or are you the first? I'm the first, absolutely none. Well, then what does come first for you, your interest in the medical world or the military world? Definitely the military world. So I'm a dentist by profession. However, I'm definitely not passionate about teeth. I am passionate about people, though. The fact that I can work in the military and work with good people and help a bigger cause really motivates me. Okay, so what first took your interest in the military then? How did it first catch your eye? Basically, I come from a pretty conservative family. They consider like men and women to have different roles. And I wasn't really exposed to a lot as a child. And when I was finished university, I really just wanted to chuck myself in the deep end and learn some life skills. So um, I put an application in and then just went for it. So you saw an opportunity to break convention and test yourself in something new and exciting. Yeah, pretty much. So you have this interest in people. What then draws you to marry that up with the profession of teeth? Oh, well, <laughs> well, honestly, like I said, it's not the teeth that made me choose dentistry. It's the people. And I guess like I do work private practice from time to time. And the thing that I enjoy the most about it is like I work on the weekends where there's a lot of emergency cases and people come in in pain and I love them leaving not in pain. Or people come in generally like dead scared of the dentist and I just go, challenge accepted. (laughs) So hopefully they go back a little bit happier. So when you began studying dentistry, did you have the goal of joining the military in mind or you just had the goal of helping people and applying that to the military context came later? The second one, I actually decided to join the military in my final year. It was after a DFR lecture, so which is Defence Force Recruiting. So their recruiting budget pays off. <laughs> I hope so. So why the Air Force in particular? Look, I didn't really know the difference. I did a bit of research. Um, fortunately, there was like one person from each service at the university at the time, so I did get the opportunity to talk to them all. I didn't have a preference. and I probably picked the one that gave me the offer first. I did go to and gave me a board interview first, which was Air Force. Tell me a bit more about your military training experience. Was that what you expected or did you have any expectations going in? All I knew of the military is what I'd seen in the movies. And I have to say officer training school is not exactly like the movies. And I know it's changed in the last couple of years even more so. But I just thought head down, bum up, do what you're told. And it's like 18 weeks of them trying to instill what they think are military values. I had never been camping before. Like pretty much every experience that I went through during officer training school was completely new for me because I was a bit of a shy child or like grew up fairly conservatively, didn't really 
propel my voice a lot. I was known in the group for not saying much. So I still remember um, the very first time I got a compliment was they put me in like a leadership position to lead a team from like point A to point B. And it was a group of about 30, 40 people. And honestly, I was just leading the way in terms of the march and not really saying much. So being a fairly uneventful leader, I guess. But then I realized nobody was paying attention. And for the first time, I like swore when I was yelling. which isn't very, very unlike me. And I still remember them thinking that it's good to be able to assert yourself when you don't normally in a context that you think you need to, to get attention. (laughs) So I just remember that one because everyone was shocked. Is uh, challenging you with new experiences to tap into unexplored parts of yourself, shall we say? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So you get through OTS. What's your first posting? Amberley in Ipswich. And how'd you find that? Even though you're fully qualified dentist and you've just finished officer training school, you still, as a specialist officer, you still have to finish your basic dental courses. So I was still being heavily mentored for about a year and a half after I joined, not so much in the clinical realm, but like doing all the courses that defence needed me to and whatnot. You've got through officer training school, you've been studying medicine. You've obviously got quite a lot of ability to focus and apply yourself. I'm wondering at this point, are you looking forward and do you have personal or professional goals you want to achieve out of a military career? I have to say when I first started, I didn't actually know what goals there were. Like I didn't know how to direct my career at all. Didn't really know anyone in the military to ask questions. So I've been in for nine years now and I've definitely come across a lot of people I really respect and have been really good mentors for me and have helped me pick the path in my career that I'm so fortunate to have run. So you're at Amberley for a couple of years, Mm -hmm. and then after your time there, you're involved in an Indigenous outreach program. Can you tell me about that? So it was actually an Army Indigenous outreach program called ACAP, and the reason I did that program was because at the time the Army had sent all their dentists to different areas and didn't have someone to call on, so they asked Air Force to fill. Um, So it's definitely not something that we get exposure to from Air Force very frequently. We went to Freegon in the middle of Australia where there's an Indigenous population. We set up a deployable dental unit. They set up more than just that, but from my perspective, that's what we did. We basically just saw all the Indigenous people. I was there for just over two and a half weeks, so three weeks, and we rotated out with other dentists. To be honest, I can't remember the entire period because it's a few years ago now that they do the program for. Because the military does do quite a lot in these kind of outreach programs. And if you've joined with the goal, the passion for helping people, you will have encountered a lot of people in need of a good dentist and you could have, uh, you know, I imagine you made quite a difference to some people. Well, I'd hope so. I definitely pushed through a lot of work in the time that I was there. I mean, I guess that was the intent of it as well. So it was probably the first tick in the box for me. I hadn't done anything other than treat like military people, make sure they were good to deploy prior to that. It must have given you a real lift in your military career as well because you've moved on from your first airbase and you're doing something, like you say, that's not just treating other military people. Did this lead to you thinking perhaps of looking towards further deployments, perhaps overseas or something more? To be honest, the very first time I started to get really excited was um, in my second posting where I was in Darwin. I was selected to do Pacific Angel, which is like a joint exercise with the USAF. They basically do humanitarian exercises all over the world for two to three week periods. The one that I went to was in Nepal and we basically saw as a team of 30 or 40 clinicians saw thousands and thousands of Nepalese civilians with the Nepalese military. And that's when I started to think a little bit more outside the box. Let's talk about the Nepal trip. What's your day-to-day life like over there? You put up in a average hotel with all the other forces, so USAF and Australians together. You wake up five o'clock, have breakfast, and then you head in like it's a two hour, three hour travel. So it was in the Chitwan region. I can't remember the exact school, but basically we set up in a school. So it was two hours out from the hotel, drove there, started about seven. The Nepalese military used to like bring order to the civilian population because it's free treatment. So it's a bit disorganized in terms of the amount of people that want treatment. And then they just cut it off at probably about five. Then we drive back home, seven, have dinner, go to bed, start all over again for two weeks. (laughs) Must be an intense two weeks and you're working with a foreign military there as well. So a lot of new experiences for you. So rewarding though. So rewarding. Definitely worth the hard work. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. 
And at RAF Base Darwin, you were the officer in charge of a medical detachment there. Yes, I was the detachment officer in charge for two expeditionary health squadron. The main headquarters for that unit is in Williamtown, and Darwin's one of its detachments. So you were first posted to Amberley in 2011, and by the time you're in Darwin, it's 2014. Your career's in good swing by this point, and you've had that taste of Nepal. Really, it's Afghanistan that's your next big trip. Yeah, correct. So that was in 2016, and that was after yet another posting. So at this point, I didn't finish another posting cycle, like, full term. So I posted from Darwin after one year, and then in my second year at Tyndall, which is near Catherine in the NT, I got deployed to Afghanistan as the sole dentist for a NATO base. Actually, correction, there is a Turkish dentist or another coalition dentist that sees just their forces, but the rest of the NATO elements are seen by the Australian dentist that's in place. So the Turkish dentist usually only sees their own forces. and We work together in that regard. So almost a sole dentist treating the NATO forces. Yeah. <laughs> How did you react when you first learned you were going to Afghanistan? I was so excited because I said my initial intention was to be exposed to as much as I could and learn things. A lot of the time you're quite oblivious to what you're walking into. Like we don't get a general awareness other than what the public does as to what happens in those countries. So you don't know what you're going to be exposed to and you kind of take for granted that the military will keep you safe, especially as a medical professional, you think you're going to be out of harm's way. So I definitely went there excited, not knowing that it's still a bit of a you know hostile area. Being a clinician does give you a bit more security than those that are in the forefront of the danger. But in saying that, we did have indirect fire to the base in general, nowhere near where I was, fortunately, but we'd get bunkered down for hours and hours at a time when there was a possibility of threat. That happened a fair few times, but no one got hurt, as far as I'm aware. The base has over 35 NATO nations on there. And like I said, we as the Australians predominantly support the majority of those. We're generally not seeing the local nationals at all, but there are some contractors on base that do come in for emergencies and I did, with permission, treat them and they were extremely grateful. One scenario in particular that stands out to me was there was a US Special Forces member who came in probably at like 1am Several people came into the emergency department and they called me in because he had smacked his own face with a grenade launcher. <laughs> the, the recoil of it. So I basically had to like patch up all the soft tissue and the teeth that he had broken. It's probably the, the only like war dental trauma that I saw. Do you know if it was on the worst receiving end of that discharge, him or the target of the grenade launched? I don't know that, but he was still in pretty good spirits, so I think things must have happened the way he anticipated. You've also lived in many different countries just growing up, as you shared with me earlier, so I suppose living in another country for a more sustained period like this was not too much of an adjustment for you. Oh, definitely not, and you're surrounded by people that are in the same environment, so they're away from family and if you can imagine like a small town where everybody looks after each other, that's probably what it's like for six months. And how'd you find the climate there? Not too bad. I went during the better season in Afghanistan and when I was leaving in January, it started snowing. So there's like a, probably two feet of snow outside that we had to walk through, but that only lasted for about two weeks when I got there, when I was there, I mean. While you're away doing all this work, are you able to keep in touch well with friends and loved ones back home? Yeah, definitely. It's not always the best comms, but the comms guys are phenomenal. And the Defence Force, the Australian Defence Force, really take care of their members. I think we're actually one of the only forces that provide Wi-Fi of any sort to their members free of charge. It's only a very small amount and it's purely for welfare purposes, but the American forces have to pay for their own. We're definitely grateful. And it does cut in and out and there are times where they cut it off for security reasons, but for the most part, you can definitely keep in touch with family, if, even if it's just first via messages. How 21st century of Australia. I know, right? Before and concurrent with all these deployments, you're also doing a lot of volunteer dental work in Vietnam, India. Can you share with me some of those experiences? I started my first year out of university and I basically would just join other NGOs who were already doing it, just give my services. But my trigger to start my own was actually after I went to Nepal, I was in a team of medical people. One of my closest friends, he's actually a nurse in the, in the Air Force. And I looked and he was at Nepal with me just by fluke. And I basically said to him, I reckon we could repeat this like 
of our own, put our own funds in. So the next year, me, I put all the funds in. I kept in touch with one of the US planners, got him to give me like all the planning considerations and basically did something to a similar scale, but in South India of my own. So that was really rewarding. And just to put some numbers there for full context, you treat something like over 500 children in the Vietnam trip and then in India you're well into the thousands that you're attending. The Vietnam trip was me as an individual. I've done three big ones in India now but that's obviously not just me doing that. There's a huge team of clinicians and we pump it out in about four days so about a thousand people per day which if you are a doctor or a nurse out there know that that is not an any easy feat. No, I appreciate that you've got people working with you, but the number is still staggering. Yeah, it's crazy. It's definitely like, it's definitely huge. The people that tend to come with me usually really, really want to give back. So we can do anywhere between 15 to 20 hour days for about a week. Definitely long, exhausting trips. What's your current role in the Air Force, Ajitha? So I am posting back to Ambly in 2019. However, uh, I'll talk about the one from this year. And that is the operations officer for two expeditionary health squadron at Williamtown, as well as the senior dental officer for the squadron. Talk me through your role and responsibility there. Senior dental officer is basically you're a mentor for the junior dentists and do complex cases with them. Uh, don't have as much clinical time as I previously would because they're generally the ones that are the workforce, I guess. And the operations officer, and I'm really fortunate to have been given that opportunity because it's given me a massive insight onto all the domestic and international support elements, the health supports within the Air Force. Headquarters Health Services Wing will send you a request for a task, basically, and then you have to find people within your squadron that are suitable for that task and send them on it. The Air Force has obviously challenged you to embrace new skill sets and you've had to foster and grow them. You shared with me the story where you had to employ some colourful language to assert your leadership on that course. But now you're running volunteer projects, you're a senior officer in various postings and deployments. So you've had to sort of grow into this role. What other kind of skills has the military taught you? I have to say that one time at officer training school is the only time I have sworn. <laughs> you definitely do not need that skill. Um, unfortunately, I meant enough, a skill of leadership, <laughs> not swearing. But... Yeah, yeah. No, I just mean like I've never had to use it again because um, I've always been surrounded by people that are generally good at their job. And I guess my job is to provide them direction and take my commanding officer's vision and make it happen with the team. And you get better at it with time. So you find out what the motivating factors are for people and try and get them to the end state by achieving their personal goals as well. And that generally makes people more interested and want to work with you to get the job done. What's the most rewarding part about your career? Definitely getting people to their goals as well. So since I've been promoted to squadron leader specifically, I have a lot more influence, I guess. And if I think that somebody has potential and they're willing to take the initiative to progress themselves, I actually have, I can help them get there if they want to. And I definitely like seeing other people develop. You're off to Amberley again next year, but do you have your eyes set on another goal or deployment beyond that or see what comes? Probably see what comes, do a good job in my new role. That's probably it. Just as long as I'm stimulated and motivated, I'll be happy. Ajitha, thanks for your time today. Thank you so much, Alex. My conversation with Ajitha was recorded in November 2018. Ajitha is not the first dentist in uniform we've had on this podcast. You can also listen to number nine, David Leaf, in season one for Angus Horden's interview with the Vietnam veteran. Find us online at www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast, and on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod. And get in touch with us by emailing podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget...